Howdy Partners, and welcome to another episode of the Howdy Partners podcast. Today, we have my friend, Franz, who I recently met up with in the Bahamas. And before we dive into everything, Franz, how's, how are you? How are the, how's the Bahamas right now? I'm good. Uh, I, I don't miss like cloudy London right now. One of the exact reasons why I went down there to, to meet up with you, because not a lot of sunlight in Canada and I was feeling it. So Ben, how are you? It's been a bit since we've had you on. Yeah, I'm, I'm good, mate. Busy. Um, definitely, I'd imagine a, maybe 10 to 20 degrees colder than, than Franz is in the Bahamas. We're in uh, Salt Lake and yeah, lots of snow when I look out the window. Nice. And um, so today we're going to be talking about partner marketing. Franz recently made a LinkedIn post about the 20 plus marketing program, partner marketing programs that they ran with their partners. And so I'm really excited to dive into the do's, the don'ts and the, the lessons learned from all of these programs. But before we dive into that, Franz, give everyone an introduction for yourself. Where are you at right now and what are you building? My journey basically in partnerships started around two years ago. So First of all, like three years ago in March 2020, I was a account executive at Hopin. So I was on the sales side of things, shifted then into the channel partnerships team. So that was a fully new team at Hopin and I built it out myself. And that's kind of like the kind of audience which would enjoy this podcast a lot. It's the kind of people who are either setting up a partnerships team for the first time, either channel partnerships or agency partnerships uh, or technology partnerships, which is what I did afterwards or the kind of people who recently saw a reduction headcount because we grew our partnerships team to four people and then reduced it again to one person right now, which is just me. And that just requires you to be a lot more resourceful um, and thoughtful about the kind of partnerships you want to do and also the kind of partner marketing activities you want to do. So that really inspired this post because I've done channel partnerships at Hopin and then I built out our Hopin app store with up to 50 apps. And now I lead all our BD efforts for Hopin as well as StreamYard, which is a live streaming tool. And we've tried over 20 different partner marketing programs and partner marketing motions over the last two years. And what I really realized now that we're only one person again is that a lot of them didn't work. And that kind of inspired this post because I really wanted to show that there's one specific type of partner marketing motion which really works, at least for us, and I hope for others as well. And that's the kind of motion which you can actually follow through on as well if you're a one-person team. I think this is coming at a great time for a lot of people with um, what we're seeing in the market, a lot of team reductions in similar positions like you. Um, would love to start off with kind of how you started things off around how you see certain partner marketing programs fail. Um, and I think that's an interesting place to start just to, to maybe get out of the way things people may be doing wrong or common mistakes. I think for me, the number one defining factor is whether it can actually yield sustainable results, right? And I think that's where most partner marketing programs will fail. So if you think about it, when you like launch an integration, you worked around three to six months maybe with that partner to get everything in place, sign the contract, go to for the security view and so forth. And then you launch the integration. And that's a moment where people all of a sudden just get lazy. They're like, well, let's write a blog post and then we're done. But that's not helpful, right? Like because you write one blog post, you make one social media announcement, and then maybe you enable your CSMs once or account executives once, and then you walk away. So you have spent six months building the integration, but you only spend like, maybe like a week or two actually launching it. That's kind of like a really common mistake I see in partnerships, because even then when you follow up with another blog post or maybe you bring a joint webinar out to the market, that's not gonna help either, right? These are all flash in the pan motions. These are all motions which are just kind of like, get your audience maybe excited, maybe they remember once, but if you ever worked in sales, you know that like, you need to be either at the right time at the right place or you need to have multiple touch points, right? So you would need a lot of these kind of touch points if you want to actually convert anybody to use the integration. It can come across as laziness a little bit, to be honest, right? Like once you've launched the integration, you've done the, done the work and then suddenly you're in a position of one shared blog post and then nothing else happens. What do you think or why do you think that happens? Because I'm, I know partner managers aren't lazy. Everybody has a ton on their plate. So like what, what's the reason that people don't engage past that initial like announcement post? Yeah. I mean, you, you've probably been in the same position, right? Like you worked on something for six months to bring it to market. And then there's actually like a shiny object syndrome. So by now you actually found a different integration you wanna work on. So you actually just dilute your focus. You just kind of move on to the next thing before actually bringing the first one really to conclusion. And I think that's the, the biggest issue I see. The other issue I also found a lot is that you also rely a lot on your partner to market you. So that means that you build the integration, you invest all the resources. So then the deal is that they do all the marketing, right? But now the joke's on you because once you build the integration, it's already there. Like the partner already has all the benefit, right? So yes, they could market it, 
but they might also have other priorities, right? So they might not actually go and follow through with their commitment as much as you thought they would, right? And then the third one, which happens a lot, is that especially bigger partners might dangle like a carrot in front of you as well, right? They might say like, hey, our blog gets like a million views every month, right? But the audience is so diluted that it doesn't really matter to you if there's a million views, right? Or maybe they post six blog posts a day. So then you're like one out of six blog posts a day, which gets like 200 views and that's it, right? So these kind of metrics, which often are dangled in front of you, might not actually be as helpful to your company when you think about like how to get an integration to market um, as other initiatives, which we're going to talk about in a bit. Do you, or have you used some of the tooling that exists now, like your reveal and cross beams where you can see pretty quickly, like audiences to target and to market to, like, have you used any of those tactics or techniques to, to promote integrations? Cause I'm just thinking through what you mentioned. It's a common thing. Like I've run into it where they said, Hey, you know, blog post really good on SEO and you get barely any clicks and it just becomes this pointless piece of collateral. Yeah. Um, so we've cross beam in the past and, uh, I'm starting to get more reveal requests. I actually got one yesterday. So now, you know, that will join the reveal team. I feel like it's about time to, to upgrade and at least use both solutions. But it is something which we've done in the past. We've seen mixed results. Sometimes it's been really helpful just to gauge whether there is a shared audience. Sometimes there's like a startup and you have like 2000 shared customers where you're like, wait, hold on a second. Like that doesn't seem realistic, right? So then there might be also like a, a mismatch on how we define customer with that startup as well. So there is, it's not the silver bullet, but it is definitely a, something which can help you build conviction. I think something which I found was actually more helpful, at least to us, was just to understand more about our own audience, right? So if we understand, for example, who, like, who is using what tool and then understand how much revenue is associated with that, that's a really big one for us. So um, actually Marco, like one of the, the guy at Whiplash, he recently uh, posted something which I thought was really interesting around like how revenue or ARR associated with an integration or partner is actually completely undervalued. And I think that's really been like, mind blowing for me because for a long time, we just valued if somebody adopted an integration over anything else, because we knew that adoption meant higher retention and higher renewal rates, right? But actually what turned out is that when we dug into the numbers, there were integrations which were used by fewer customers, but actually the AR associated with that was like three times as high as the AR associated with the second highest integration. So that really showed us that these customers are higher value for us and they're more likely to stick around, which then led us to double down on them as well. Yeah, I love those insights. Um, I wanted to reflect on what I've done in the past, and I've definitely done the, hey, here's a blog post, you know, we get this much traffic. And so I'm sitting here thinking like, yep, yep, uh, that was the wrong thing to do. Not that it's bad to do. And so if anyone's thinking like, oh, I've done that before, it's not the only thing that you should do. You should, you know, maybe give that, but then also do other things associated with it. Um, you know, repurpose that content, do socials, uh, you know, if you have a podcast, put it on the podcast, like really make sure that it's being distributed appropriately versus just doing that one-off uh, program. And same sentiment, I actually, I had used the account mapping tools. I was using Crossbeam at the time to overlap um, our email list actually with another's email list to see, you know, what is that co-marketing opportunity for, you know, who we could cross pollinate even from the top of funnel. Um, so that's, that, that's a really good way to not only, of course, vet, you know, what the revenue opportunity is and what the integration potential can look like, but also from the even higher level on the partner marketing side of things, you can overlap and see, oh, we actually have, you know, this many already in our communities or in our email list. So I, I love that example because it's so straightforward, right? Like it makes it a lot easier to understand. Like if you spend like four hours writing a really, really good blog post and you just put it on medium hit post, maybe you like link it on LinkedIn and then go like, you know, we post it on LinkedIn to my network as well. And then you walk away. So one, one of my favorite examples around this is for example, McDonald's, like McDonald's burgers. Some people like them, others are not the biggest fans, but they're the best sold burgers in the world, right? They're way more sold than the burgers I make at home, even though my burgers might be better, right? But it's not the best burger which is sold the most, it's the best promoted burger which is sold the most. So ideally, in an ideal world, you spend like 50% of your time building the product, building the integration, and then you double down by spending the next 50% of the time on actually marketing it. We definitely had that help scout where I walked into like an environment, we had 80 integrations already, and it was like, okay, but there was no go to market around any of them. And so 
there's a part of work that goes into going back, backtracking, relaunching the integrations again, re-promoting them, right? Which which causes a lot of complexity. So yeah, I love that idea. Um, so switching gears, sw switching gears a little bit, mate, and and we talked through like some of the issues that exist and some of the risks and the, the missteps. Would love to to change gear and talk about some of the things that do work. So would love to kind of ask you around like what are your like favorite partner marketing uh, programs in terms of like the ones that contribute the highest value in your opinion? Great question. And I think that needs to be preluded a little bit that a partner marketing motion or a partner marketing program is really just like a tool, right? So it's like a screwdriver or a hammer or whatever. So depending on what the situation is, you might want to use a different one, even though there are some which I find are more effective than others. But let's first discuss a little bit like how we understand where we want to like target a customer, right? And it all starts with like the user journey. So you want to start mapping the user journey first. And I think that's generally important in partnerships anyways, because that helps you understand whether or not you actually have a partnerships opportunity here or not. So Hopin is a virtual events company, and I think this is a really fun example to use. Let's say you want to have an event and you want to have a photo booth, right, in your event. Which one are you going to buy first? You're probably first going to figure out what you want to host your event, and then you're going to figure out which photo booth plugs into that, right? So similarly, photo booth companies have a lot of incentive to work with us and try to co-market with us because our AEs and our CSMs are actually the right people at the right time to talk with a customer about what kind of engagement tools they could use, right? But now let's go, for example, for one step up the chain, right? Let's say like, you know, Hopin wants to partner with CRM companies, right? That works because we are the right ones to talk to somebody who just bought a CRM, right? You just bought a CRM, you want to start your marketing motion. The CRM company might go like, hey, here are different tools you can use for webinars, virtual events, email marketing, and so forth. And then they recommend us, right? But the inverse is not true. The inverse is that we wouldn't be the right ones to recommend to you whether you should buy HubSpot or Salesforce. We're not in the position to do that because we come further down the chain, right? So that's really important to understand where are the different products located along the user's journey and along this chain to understand where you actually have value to add as a partner marketer. I, uh, I reference it as a SaaS buying river is, is like yeah. the common, common thing that I use. And it, and it's, it is a great, um, point. And again, relaying it back to help scout, we were a customer support tool. And you think about the order that people buy tools and it usually does go CRM first of all, right? Maybe some marketing automation, potentially support. And then we had partners like Aircall that need a customer support tool for them to be tied into. Right. And so to your point, I, I love that. Um, I love that image of like a map or a river where you actually plot out where do, where do, where do customers buy certain tools and then where can you plug in from a partnership perspective. Uh, perspective. So yeah, I, I love that. And so once you've got that figured out and, and you've kind of, you've already kind of enunciated how well you planned it out a hop in and you've got those kind of structured points. Um, what type of, what type of programs work for each one, I guess, in terms of which ones are effective? Yeah. So it really depends on what kind of company you have or like what kind of company you run and what kind of go to market motion you have, um, for sales led products, it might be a little bit trickier, but you can still offer, for example, a trial or like a way for a customer to get started with you. Right. I love the example, which, you know, partner hacker founder, Jared, uh, always talks about with PandaDoc where they were in the onboarding email of HubSpot. I think that's like the exact right way of doing it where when a new customer comes in, they're going to look for a bunch of tools, right? They're going to look for like, you know, something to sign their documents. They're going to look for something to like run their marketing campaigns or email campaigns if they don't want to use HubSpot. They might look for a new scheduling tool, right? It's like Chili Piper. So that's the right way to like tackle it if you're one of those tools. Um, another thing which worked really well for us is when you're a product-led growth company that you just give away the tool like for, you know, a month or so for free. Like that's perfect because at least, for example, on StreamYard on the live streaming side, a lot of these large social media platforms which we work with don't necessarily have their own tool. So they always need a third party to recommend it to. And if one of them is for free for now, that's fine. Like you can just give it to them for free. And then the customer, by the time of like, you know, the actual expiry, expiration of the free trial, they don't even think about using another tool because by now they're so used to using your tool that they don't want to switch, right? So that's the perfect moment to get into and no competitor can compete with it because by that point, your customers are already used to your tool. In terms of like the actual content pieces, which I think work really well, one is like getting into these onboarding emails and onboarding flows. The other one would be ex um, creating video content, which buyers would want to find on YouTube and other platforms. Because generally, like I personally, when I look at new software, I always go on YouTube and try to find a video. 
instead of watching a, you know, or reading a long form blog post, right? Because especially like when it's technical and it's an integration, it's actually way easier to actually see somebody implement it rather than going for like a really long blog post with screenshots and stuff like that, trying to understand what the value would be, right? Similarly, like really good documentation is important for both teams. So really good book documentation for the partner team as well as your own team is key. And what I found there is that, you know, in, at least initially, we had two separate documentations. We had like an internal one and an external one. And what I found is that it actually is a real hassle because the internal one and external one both have to be maintained and they might not be of the same quality, right? So if you can, you should have only one documentation, which is the external public facing one and your support team references that as well. Because that's how you find issues in it. That's how you like keep it up to date. It's a lot less hassle. And it's also something which can then be used by the partner team. Because that's like the next thing which follows up is like you want to have like regular enablement sessions. So you can have actual sessions where you stay top of mind. So for example, if somebody thinks about, oh, I want to add polls to my event, they think about Slido, right? So there's a great, like this kind of like session is a great way to think about how can I stay top of mind with the partner's team, like the CSMs and the AEs and stuff like that. And then the last one, which some of our partners like Walls, for example, does really well. Walls.io is like a social, um, social media wall, which you can integrate into your events. They actually send a month, uh, a quarterly enablement newsletter. So every quarter they send like an update of like, these are the things we worked on. They have like a PDF, which is like a one pager you can send out to your customers with all the pricing and all the other updates that our CSMs and AEs might need. They send it to me and I distribute it with the team, but it's a great way to like make sure that I stay, like they stay top of mind with me and also top of mind with our teams. I That one's like, in my opinion, a really, easy lever that I don't see enough partnership teams do. Like, I think a lot of us get obsessed with the through partner marketing motion, which is like to the end user of the customer. But in actual fact, like, especially when you're partnering with a company like a Hopin or a HubSpot, for example, that have thousands of partners, potentially or hundreds of partners, the two partner marketing motion, which is promotion of you and ensuring that you remain top of mind amongst their A and CSM population is just as important in my opinion. And I, and I see a lot of partner teams that miss that totally right like miss that that whole motion totally so i love i love that you referenced that because it's 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 not done often enough i think gorgeous do it really well right like their their whole play that chris lavoir kind of piloted was sending a an email newsletter out and he doesn't even ask for permission right he'll just pull their names of like csms and AEs and just chuck them out which for me i love because if you can't get in front of people that's one way to do it some people don't like it but i think it's a, a good idea so um i know will you're you're pretty kind of bullish on the, the two partner marketing piece as well, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think it's like, um, the, I was actually almost going to work with, um, Marco DePaulis at Whiplash and, uh, it was for a partner marketing role. And the way it was structured was, uh, into three parts. It was two partner marketing through partner marketing and partner marketing internally. And I thought that was really interesting because I had only thought about, you know, distribute our platform and, you know, get revenue from that. But it's not as simple as that. You need to focus on every single way that you can market is the all three of those, you know, your partner and their organization needs to understand your offering more, your team needs to do the same. And then of course the market does as well. So um, yeah, I love that, that breakdown. So Franz, I'm curious what your favorite of regardless of, you know, um, the amount of work required or what have you, your favorite partner marketing um, program, e either the most fun one or the most useful one, what, uh, what comes to mind? It's, it's hard to pick one favorite. I think the best partner marketing programs and best partner marketing motions are the ones which actually keep in mind, one, the ICP, so making sure that you're in front of the right people, and then B, keep in mind the timing. So you should surface all the time. Like every time a customer is at the moment of making the decision, you should be there, right? So you should be somehow embedded in the process. I think that's the moment which are most important. Um, one one partner has actually done this really well with Hopin, so I thought like it would be fun to talk about them. But there's one agency called Smart Events, which I actually work with since April 2020. So they're a German events agency, um, and they wanted to become a service partner of Hopin before we had a service partner program. So they're actually one of the first 10 agencies which I launched like our agency partner uh, pilot with. And what was really fun about them was that they were fully in person, and they didn't really know anything about virtual events. But at that point in April 2020, they were about to shut down their business. They delicensed their cars, furloughed their 10 employees, and they were basically about to close down. And instead of closing down, what he did was Enrico, the founder of Smart Events, doubled down on Hopin and basically helped us build the Hopin certification by asking all the questions. 
uh, he had about Hoppin. And then throughout the next year, he grew his team from 10 people to 40 people and went from regional player to international player. And the way he did it was that he basically helped us run all of our German GTM. So smart events basically became synonymous with anything Hoppen related in Germany at a time when Hoppen itself was actually still like a startup and small. And I was the only German speaker at the company. And I thought it was really interesting because he did a couple of things um, which other agencies could do as well, like, you know, running ads, trying to be the thought leader in the virtual event space and so forth. But what I thought was the most remarkable was that he really doubled down on us. Like until today, three years later, like Smart Events is still like the number one hop in agency in Germany. And they also still talk about us every single day. And I thought that was pretty, pretty marvelous because there's always the assumption that maybe it would be better with partner marketing or like these kind of service partners to branch out, right? Like maybe it would be better to branch out than like go from hop to like another virtual events platform so you don't put all your eggs in one basket. But I think that's a mistake because what I found is that if you find a gold mine, you should just keep on digging. Like it's very hard to find a gold mine. It's very hard to find an opportunity which gives you reliable results every time. But most of the time, what people will do is they find a gold mine and then they go like, okay, this worked, maybe this other thing over there works as well. But instead, people should just keep on digging wherever the gold comes out until they don't get any results from it anymore. Well, it's like there's this whole ecosystem. You, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned HubSpot, which is, which is great, but also um, the Salesforce uh, agency piece as well, right? Like it becomes kind of confusing. You wouldn't go from being like a world-renowned Salesforce implementation agency to then being like, oh, we're also going to do pipe drive as well right like there's so much opportunity in the salesforce bucket that it becomes to your point almost like a a deep value let's say from 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 splitting up attention so so i really really like that uh franz we had to ask you for one uh tactical takeaway from today's chat what, kind of what would it be for for the listeners so many but i think the tactical takeaway really should be one understand the user journey, understand what your customers care about at every single moment in time, and then B, understand how you can plug in in that user journey as well. I loved your analogy of the SaaS buying river, and I think you really need to figure out like where you want to throw your fishing rod, uh, where you want to like put out your bait uh, through partner marketing motions along that SaaS buying river. That's a wonderful point. When you were mentioning that, I was like, it makes so much sense. That is, that's a, that's a clip right there. Um, that is a great takeaway. Everyone take a look at your buying journey that your customers are going through and figure out where your tech lies and where your partner tech lies. Thank you, Franz, for your wisdom and insights and all the stories. Um, it was great chatting with you again. And that is another episode of the Howdy Partners podcast.